Well, as I've revealed this afternoon, Treasurer Jim Chalmers is set to end the run of 15 years without a surplus when he hands down the budget on Tuesday night. Let's bring in the Nationals leader, David Littleproud, who joins us from Tasmania. David Littleproud, thanks for your time. I've, uh, yeah, thanks for having me, mate. I've, I think you're at Agfest there, aren't you? Bit of entertainment in the background. Anyway, yeah. look, uh, <laughs> I've broken this afternoon that the government looks set to deliver a surplus in 22-23. What's your reaction to that? Well, that's the legacy of the stewardship of the coalition government through one of the biggest challenges our nation's seen since the Second World War. We left the economy in a better place than where we found it before COVID-19. Unemployment down. We supported the industries that we knew that were going to continue to pay the bills, like the resource sector. The receipts that we've seen in the resource sector is what's driving this and making sure that the expenses in terms of, of social security payments have gone down because we kept the economy moving, we kept businesses going and we protected our most precious asset, our human capital, in keeping them at work. And I think what you'll see also is this has been created off the back of $23 billion worth of cuts to regional Australian infrastructure just in the last budget alone. So uh, this is really an opportunity for the federal government, the new federal government, to get their priorities right. We've left this economy, despite the challenges, in good shape. But some of the actions they've already taken, particularly when you look at the resource sector, whether it be the safeguards mechanism, whether it be increasing taxing, particularly at the state, Labor state level, uh, is, is taking away investment confidence in that resource sector, which means that the receipts won't come. So we shouldn't get comfortable with this because of the policies that this new federal government's put in place. But we're proud of our legacy that have got this nation to where it is today, particularly on an economic level. Do you agree with what looks like the government's budget strategy, though, spending restraint while providing for the most vulnerable? Well, depending where their priorities is in terms of cutting back, you've got to continue to grow the pie. Uh, and this is the challenge, and we were trying to be pragmatic particularly with things like the NDIS and making sure it's sustainable. Bill Short was always there trying to say that we need to do more, do more, and now that he's Minister, he's paring back and saying, let's be responsible. Well, we will be responsible as an opposition. We need to make sure we have a sustainable NDIS, a sustainable health model, uh, And but you, to do that, you've also got to grow the pie, and you've got to make sure that you have the infrastructure and the environment around those that create and build the pie, and that's business. Governments don't do this. Businesses do, and unless you put that environment infrastructure around them, then no one will be left to, to, to build that pie. And that's what we fear is their priorities are wrong in understanding what drives the receipts for this nation, particularly in the resource and agricultural sectors. It seems fairly clear a lot of regional roads uh, that your government promised are going to be delayed or not built. Is this reverse pork barrelling? Well, and this is exactly what it is, and the reason for the National Party is to make sure that when we are at the seat of the, of the Treasury that we get our fair share because unfortunately we have this big pendulum swing where we get three-fifths of bugger all when Labor comes in. And I've tried to be mature about this as the leader of the Nationals, is to simply say to the Prime Minister, let's have a sustainable model that regional Australia can expect every year for the roads and rail, the infrastructure that gets the product from a paddock or a pit to a port that pays the bills. Because if you don't do that, ultimately every Australian pays. And Metropolitan Australia is probably sitting there taking the sweat off their brow because uh, infrastructure in the cities is going up but they're not in the regions. But just understand this, your cost of living will go up because we can't get that, that product from a paddock to your plate. And so your food prices go up and if your energy is going up with it, which it did in the last month's inflation figures when we saw household expenditure go down on things like white goods, but inflation on energy was up 14.2%. That's because we've got challenges in getting energy because of the policies of this government, not only ideological, but also in terms of infrastructure. This is where you need common sense, practical application rather than ideology. Otherwise, that ideology doesn't meet the practical reality of what's coming out of your wallet every month. All right, let me ask you about the government's policy on vaping. Now, you've been lobbied by the tobacco industry on this and, and, I and they're significant donors to the party. Has that had any, any influence? Have they been able to persuade you around your view on this? 
No, in no way. In fact, most of our party room have supported a model that emulated that of cigarettes. I supported what Greg Hunt tried to do uh, in terms of a regulated model uh, through prescription, but it hasn't worked. You've got to be honest. If you've, you've put in place a policy that doesn't work, and particularly when children are impacted, you've got to be big enough to look yourself in the mirror and say, we got it wrong. And if you look at what has worked, and that's the National Party is using some practical experience of just saying, look what has worked. There's been an 80% reduction in juvenile use of cigarettes. And, and that's what we're saying is a model whereby regulated, regulated sales through retail for those only above 18, taking away the packaging, putting it underneath the counter and in, va in vaping, take away the flavours, then you actually are protecting the young people of the future. And that excise, that excise should go back in to trying to get everyone off not only e-cigarettes but cigarettes. We're down to now two, less than 2% uh, the, of juvenile cigarette usage, but we have got only 8% of the population in this country that have a prescription for vaping. Now, ideologically, I don't like these things at all, and I, I accept all the health advice on this that they're bad for you. But you've also got to have the practical reality about how you police it. And when you've got the Australian Federal Police Association saying, we don't know how you're going to police this. It's just where the, the medical profession needs to understand, no one's questioning their medical profession on this, but they don't necessarily know about the practical realities of policing this. And what I fear is, is that we've gone down the same model of prohibition that won't stop this, and particularly when children will be impacted, and we won't shift the dial on this, that we'll be looking at this in a couple of years' time and we haven't changed it. So what I'm not afraid to say uh, that the Nationals have taken a pragmatic view of lived experience. We're prepared to stand by this because we see this as a big problem and we want to use common sense in solving this and getting as many people off this as quickly as we can and making sure that excise goes into education as well as regional and rural health. So um, just briefly, on the tax rise itself, what's your view of that? Well, we want to make sure that that's quarantined for education, and then there needs to be more policing at the border because that'll actually drive up more excise, not just for e-cigarettes but for tobacco. But there should be a quarantined amount for regional health. We've had regional health ripped apart by this government, whether it be the PBS where we will struggle to have supply of medicine, but also the designated priority areas extended beyond regional or remote to city areas, which means we've got remote towns and country towns without doctors thanks to Mark Butler and Anthony Albanese. We've become the forgotten Australians. Here's an opportunity to put that $3.3 billion into regional Australia. All right, David Little Proud, I'm having some trouble with your soundtrack. I hope you're enjoying the music there. But uh, just while you're there, just before you go, I might ask at AgFest, where I'm hearing John Mellencamp and all manner of other things, um, have you heard, has anyone given you any feedback on the AFL team? Is, are they happy about this stadium's announcement? Are they upset? What's the, what's the reaction been? It's a mixed view down here. I think everyone wanted an AFL team. And being a Queensland, it's hard for me to understand being a, a, a big rugby league uh, fan. But, look, I think uh, in times where there's a housing crisis, where cost of living's going up, people are just concerned about these monuments to sport that are popping up. And we're going to spend billions of dollars in my home state, in Queensland, for the Olympics. Uh, and what will we have after it when we've got to make sure we've got our priorities right on people having homes, having an adequate health system and having uh, an adequate education education system before we start putting these monuments to sport up. Uh, they're great to have, but you've got to be able to afford them and you've got to have your priorities right. So very much mixed views down here, uh, particularly when people are hurting in a cost of living crisis.